Well, hope you're enjoying day one of ATX TV from the couch. If you're just joining us, I'm Emily Gibson, co-founder of ATX and one of your co-hosts for the weekend. We're so excited for this next panel. Um, for one, I grew up reading Nancy Drew, so there's already a deep love for the character. And second, there are very few shows that everyone in our office watches, and this was one of them. Uh, we all fell in love immediately with the new Nancy, and even though I am deeply terrified of ghosts, I couldn't stop watching. And then lastly, Scott Wolf was at our very first physical festival, so to have him here for our first virtual one is only appropriate. Uh, but now I'm going to bring out our moderator, Damian Holbrook. Hello. Hello, Damian. Hey. I'm going to let you take it away. Awesome. So have fun. Thank you so much, Emily. All right, guys, I am Damian Holbrook from TV Guide Magazine, and we are, we're head over heels in love with this show. From the very first episode, we in the offices, we were like, wait a minute, this Nancy Drew is kind of amazing. And then it's only gotten better since then. So I am so honored to be here at ATX from the couch to talk with these guys and to bring you some insight onto what we just saw last season, where you can see it now while we wait for the new season and some, you know, maybe some behind the scenes stuff. So first up, let's bring out our executive producer, Melinda Sue Taylor. Oh God, hi. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Like, this is so embarrassing. We might have to start over. Um, my superpower name when I was on this show about mutant X-Men was Disconnecto because I was constantly turning my phone off at the wrong moment. Nice. Anyway. nice. Well, you're keeping the powers going. Yeah. Um, we're also going to bring out your co-executive producer, Noga Landau. Hello. Hello. to laugh at Melinda's Disconnecto moment. Oh, my God. <laughs> on brand. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let's bring out our leading lady, Nancy Drew herself, Miss Kennedy McMahon. Yay! Hello! Yay! <laughs> All right, and then, oh, yes, Daddy. We've got Mr. Scott <laughs> Wolf, who plays Carson Drew. Hello. There it is. And this is, this is the coolest thing. This is why ATX is so cool, because they bring in some people for these panels that are just like, you don't think about it, and then you have them come in. So we've got Jennifer Fisher, who is an author and president of the Nancy Drew fan group, the Nancy Drew Sleuths. Jennifer! Hello. Hi! How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Doing great. All right, listen, Good. thank you guys so much. I am so excited about this, because again, head over heels in love with the show. We introduced it at Comic-Con at New York and then San Diego. And just along the first season, people have been falling in love with this show. It's scary, it's smart, it's so funny. Um, that's something that I love telling people about, that this show is funny. Um, and it, the greatest thing is, it's not like the gritty take on things. It's just a good take on things. So Noga and Melinda, let's talk about this first. There have been several attempts to revitalize this brand. What, what was it that you guys saw in this character that you could bring something new to? Noga should answer that. Well, I think that Mel and I both grew up reading Nancy Drew books. And I think as young girls, we loved that she was also a young girl, but you know, was such a bold, brave, adventurous character. And I think that any, any other attempts to bring Nancy Drew to TV in the past couple of decades have, have been totally legit. I do think that what we did differently than those others was we let Nancy just be an 18 year old girl like she always was in the original books. You know, I think there were some other kind of trial and errors where she was like a grown woman, where she was like an NYPD detective, like, you know, all the, all the sort of experiments to see if that was a version of Nancy Drew that people wanted. Ultimately, I realized that, like, let's just make her who she always was, which was a teenager coming of age and being a total badass. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you got ghosts, that. Right? <laughs> so, Melinda, when you guys sat down and, and started thinking about this, who came up with the idea of the supernatural element? That was all Noga. I was fortunate to come onto this train when it had already been greenlit as a pilot script that had been written wonderfully by Noga and Stephanie and Josh. So Noga had this idea, like, when there were ghosts in the books, it always turned out to be the old man in the attic or whatever. But for Noga, I actually think that ghosts are real for Noga. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I started out as a, as a screenwriter writing um, thrillers and, and a lot of supernatural horror. And so when it came time to think about, the, well, first I learned that this project was open. 
which was the most exciting thing that I'd ever heard in my life because I'd always wanted to make this into a TV show. And then I realized that the two things that I always loved, horror and Nancy Drew, could become one and work quite well together if we did a version of Nancy Drew where ghosts, to her shock, are actually real. And now, 90 years of this character, Jennifer, that is, <laughs> that's a lot of canon and a lot of fans. Like, you've got, like, fame, like, Sonia Sotomayor, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, Hilary Rodden, like, these, she has heavy hitter fans. Yes. Why do you think this one clicked? Well, I think you have several factors. One, she debuted in 1930. Women had got the right to vote about 10 years before. And girls were just ready for that change. You know, we were progressing. And she was just like a breakout character. You had other female characters in other series, but nothing like Nancy Drew. You know, she was motherless. Her father doted on her. He respected her. She had a fantastic roadster. She could drive all over, have all these wonderful adventures. And, you know, it was just new and fresh for girls. And I think that just carried the day. And over time, you know, she just became this icon for women. So inspiring, so bold, so daring. And, you know, we always felt like if Nancy could do it, so could we. Mm -hmm. And I like to joke, because you mentioned our Supreme Court justices, I like to joke, you know, read a Nancy Drew book, become a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> it's not that easy, obviously, but, you know, it's pretty awesome when the women on the Supreme Court think that Nancy Drew was such an inspiration. Yeah. yeah, Ruth Ginsburg also quoted her. Or, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. like, when, you've got, mm -hmm. when you've got Ruth, you know, supporting <laughs> your show, like, that's just. Yeah, I know. Um, and I'm the, part of Ruth on the bulletin board in Nancy's room. I don't know if anyone's yeah, seen. there. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so the idea of, of taking this is bold enough, but then you have the critical move of finding the right Nancy. Yeah. Like, this is. There's yeah. there's nothing more important than nailing this character. Like you've Very got true. what when you when Kennedy came in, and I know Kennedy was a huge Nancy Drew fan, but when she came in, did you guys say like, yeah? Well, we she's got the Jew. The start that she was special and obviously innately understood the character and was somebody that. I felt like, oh, I would be very happy if my daughter hung out with her for an afternoon and just kind of like look up to her. And I think that was important as well. But I think it was also her ability to take notes and like internalize them and instantly produce something like blossoming and magical from a very simple um, direction. So for instance, Kennedy uh, came in and she was dressed sort of like Katherine Hepburn for her screen test and she was wonderful looking, but she presented as so mature and together that we were kind of like, can she play the kid who hasn't figured herself out yet? Mm -hmm. And so we had her come back for like a little work session before she went to network the next day. And I said, do you mind taking off your earrings and necklace? Do you mind not wearing makeup? Put your hair in a ponytail, wear sneakers, wear t-shirt, wear jeans. And she came in and she, you know, suddenly I was like, oh, this is a teenager who doesn't quite know how to voice herself, but knows in her head what she wants to say. And then we had a conversation about my daddy issues, long story short, <laughs> she, she was so vulnerable and wonderful. The next time she read the scene, I was like, that's it. That's exactly the person who we want to cast. And that is the scene we want to set up the nine episode arc to when she hugs her dad. And, you know, I also want to say that our casting in answer to your first question, I think is critical to why the show is working. I mean, Noga's ideas and writing and vision for it are fantastic and wonderful, but the cast is what makes it comes to life. And they're all so authentic in their own characters and they bring so much of themselves to the table and all clicks together so well. Everybody, I'm thrilled with them. And Kennedy, I, we've talked before about this, but still, I mean, even a year after taking on the, the, the whole thing, is it still like super pressure to be playing this character? You know, it comes in waves. I think I had a moment like maybe a week and a half ago where I was like, oh, I I am Nancy Drew. <laughs> and it was like, huh, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> and I think then, then it kind of like a wave came back and I was like, oh my God. I was like, oh, wait, huh. Um, I'm like, yeah, it comes and goes in waves. I think, you know, I have been so incredibly supported by everybody on our team. And I think it's just been about how can we commit so fully to the Nancy that's on our pages and the Nancy that we're creating that is coming from a bunch of people that have loved Nancy from her 
initial origin, including myself, including Melinda and Noga and uh, our writing team and our creators that are taking our own individual experiences of her and, and how she's been filtered through our own eyes. Cause I think that's something, you know, that she's, when you read the books and when you, you know, immerse yourself in that character, you kind of, as a woman, you put, you know, her within yourself and how, you know, how she kind of translates through your own experience. So I think we've all kind of taken bits and pieces of, of who Nancy is to us and put her into who we put on our screens now in our adaptation. And you described her early on as she's messy. She's, mm -hmm. This is not the cookie cutter perfect character. She's, she's flawed. She, she, I love, she's very progressive. Um, and one mm -hmm. of the great things, and, and I had tweeted this out um, because you take so many good big swings with the show, but probably the biggest swing you took was altering the relationship that we expect from Carson and Nancy. Mm -hmm. You know, so many of us who grew up with this character in various forms, like he was the doting father, like Jennifer said, um, you know, sometimes sitting there with the pipe, just, you know, with a book <laughs> open, advising her on her mysteries, um, and here you've given us a very messy relationship. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think because we wanted to, at least at the pilot stage, always ground this character of Nancy in something relatable and emotional. The truth is, is that when you lose a parent, the relationship between a child and a parent that is now living shifts. And sometimes it gets really dysfunctional and really messy when you share a tragedy like that. And it was important to capture that from the very beginning, that the sort of darkness that hangs over Nancy at the beginning of the show is that she's just lost her mother and she's mourning. And so is Carson. He's mourning the loss of his wife. But also it's, it was important from the beginning to lay the seeds of the fact that Carson is at the center of the biggest mystery that... Nancy's ever going to solve this first season. Mm -hmm. And Scott and Kennedy, how much did you know about that reveal <laughs> going in? Kennedy, you want to go ahead? I didn't, nobody told me anything. <laughs> Kennedy solved um, it because she is Nancy Drew. <laughs> wow. I, know, we knew she was I was doing the, the pilot and I was like, something's not, something doesn't line up. <laughs> something's not quite I was like why why this you know ghostly figure you know why are we giving spoilers no I mean, um, <laughs> are we talking about yeah, it's all done it? yeah yeah okay great your first um, season is available I'll throw this out there right now your season is available <laughs> on the CW app and on HBO Max so everyone can go binge the entire first season right now mm -hmm. um okay great thank you um I just want to make sure I didn't put my foot in my mouth um so yeah obviously there was this I was like, why, why Nancy? Why is this ghost interested in Nancy? You know, of all people, you know, she has this sort of town reputation and what has Nancy done to, so I was trying to piece together. I was like, maybe, I was like, maybe it's the sea queen that maybe Tiffany was a sea queen and maybe this. And I was just sort of like all of these different like calculations in my head until I went. And we, we actually did a mirrored shot of Nancy spinning in the graveyard by mm -hmm. her friends in this, her sea queen dress in the prequel. Um, that matched the spinning of Nan of Lucy in her pink dress as she fell down uh, to the bottom of the cliff. And I was like, oh, you sly dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really, that's really what I, but I didn't know, I didn't know for sure. Oh, wow. I think then that was, that became clear to me, but yeah. yeah. Scott? And Scott, when did you find out? So I knew uh, right away. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say right away. When, when I first met with the team, uh, I did not know anything about that. They did walk me through a substantial sort of uh, arc for Carson within the, the scope of the story. Mm -hmm. um, what I can say is when I first read the script, I was, I don't know, there's something about hearing a, a, the name Nancy Drew you have all these associations from years and years and from my own childhood. And I was a huge fan of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. And so you have these kind of projections about what this story probably looks like. And then when I read the script, I just was, so, I was so blown away by it. And I was so taken with a lot of what you're talking about, which was 
that so many things were were made, you know, the essence of who Nancy is, the essence of the, the even the essence of the Carson and Nancy relationship, and so much about this story is so directly tied to these books. But I've said from the beginning, if you told the story the way it was told in the 1930s, nobody could really consume it in the 2020s. And so this huge departure in terms of this, you know, season one story long arc and the, the uncovering of, of this primary mystery that involves Nancy and Carson. Um, when I got told about it, it was before I had shot a thing. And, and so I was, I was, it fit with what I began to understand was how challenging and um, uh, complicated Noga and, and Melinda and the team wanted to make this uh, iteration of Nancy Drew. Um, my first thought was, that's the coolest thing I've heard since I was connected to this story. My second thought was, oh no, you know, because this vital relationship that I think we've all associated with for years is now something very, very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that that was concerning to me. I was like, oh no, if he's if he's not her dad, like mm -hmm. he could be a killer. He could be killed. Um, Jennifer, <laughs> as the president of the fan club, I mean, there's like, <laughs> there are fandoms, and then there are people who like officially have the title of fan, and you are, you know. What did you think when you when you got wind of that? Well, <laughs> I was like, hmm, boy, that's a twist that most fans probably weren't going to be expecting. I mean, Carson's Mr., you know, respectful, doting dad in the books, and it's like a total 180 in some respects in this. And I mean, it does keep it fresh. It does keep it more modern. Like he was saying, filming, you know, 30s and 40s Nancy, you'd have to be a period piece and would... Most fans find that relevant today. Some would, some wouldn't. So you take some risks. I think it's going to be interesting how this plays out in season two, because I think there's going to be a lot more twists up their sleeves. Yeah. There's always <laughs> more twists up yes, their sleeves. from us. <laughs> I started looking up, like, Our who, kids? maybe he has another child. Who could yes. it be? Uh, uh, <laughs> there was, and I want to talk about, because again, like, for all the scares, for all the great twists, for all the, you know, the supernatural stuff, like the, it was the family stuff, it was the relationship stuff, mm -hmm. it was the friend stuff that was really just so, so addictive. But that scene between Scott and Kennedy at the end of, I think it was Haunting of Nancy Drew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I did not sign up for that heartbreak. <laughs> that scene was devastating. Yeah. How, how hard was that to film? I mean, Kennedy, you have like, can you tell the story about when the ACAM operator started weeping and you paused <laughs> in the middle to comfort him? <laughs> I see, I think four words in that scene. Well, no, I have a couple sentences in the beginning, but like, it's really just Scott telling the story and having to sell that story and Nancy sort of wrestling with the fact that she walks into the room knowing everything and like how he, he comes out and saying it, but our, our A camera who was um, doing my coverage, his name's Sean. Um, he, we like finished a take and he went, oh, what did he say? He's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he like pulled a tissue out and he was just like, <laughs> and because they're so in it with you and our camera crew is so just devoted and kind and supportive. And they're the reason that we can have that sort of intimacy on our set. Cause if you don't have that comfort level, you can't do that. You can't, you know, get that vulnerable. And so it just was such a, 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 a such an amazing moment, I think, for us that we truly all are creating these moments together. You know, it's it's so much about where the camera operator's brain is at and where his emotional investment is at as it is mine, because it's a shared. They're like right up in your face. So it's like you're, it's, you and one in the same. So that was really cool. That was a moment where I was like, wow, our stories are like doing something. So that was cool. Yeah, and then and I, you were there for that, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, uh, he had me do it with a stand. Right, it was just a stand-in. <laughs> my my stand-in said Scott's she was never incredible. done that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, no. it was so beautiful, Scott, the way Carson just put it out there as like, there was no malice in it at all. 
no, no. And that was, you know, credit to um, Melinda and Noga and our team uh, who have built this story so authentically um, that when that moment arrives, you know, this is a moment that I think Carson has been dreading for years it, it, in ways that are probably buried away because I think, you know, I think there was probably a very long period of time where that mystery just never was something that would need to be solved, you know, and, and choices were made that, that made this moment not inevitable. And, but since the beginning of the telling of our story, when we jump in with these characters and Kate has died and, and these hauntings are beginning, um, the inevitability of this moment has, has begun. And that's the build that we see episode by episode and so by the time this moment comes, there is nowhere to go. There is nowhere to hide. And, and at the end of the day, he does, he still is the doting, loving dad that he was in the books. It's just a much more complicated life they're living. And, but at this moment where she says to him, this is what I need, he would do nothing but give her exactly that. Yeah. What is it going to do? Um, because... It happened, and then it was like, "Are you? You're out." Um, and Ryan shows up, and it's like, "I'm trying to be a better dad." And you're like, "No, no, you can't be." Um, how is this going to? No, and Melinda, what are you thinking as far as where? Like, is this going to be Nancy and my two dads? Uh, we actually have a gift for that. It's pretty yeah. great. <laughs> it is great. Yeah, I mean, it's, what's exciting about where we go from here now is it's not the kind of show where it all gets wrapped up and they're all living in a house together being happy right away. Like there's a, there's a real long journey that Nancy's going to go on now with her two dads. For sure. I mean, it's in a, a sense, a dad triangle going into season two. And I think <laughs> for uh, Carson in particular, Scott and I talk a lot about our kids and kind of like what it is to be a parent and what would it have been if Nancy had come to you at age six and said, I don't think I'm your biological kid. Would you have told her then? Would you have told her at 12? Would you have told her at two? Would you, you know, we, we really went into a lot of men. And then also, you know, coming to season two, I think there's an opportunity to really mine and explore the authenticity and the reality emotionally as a parent when you disappoint your kid, when they're old enough to say, you let me down. And you're like, you're right, I did. I mean, it's rough. It's really rough. But I think that there's so much uh, juice there story-wise and emotionally and, mm -hmm. and to kind of propel journeys because we want them to get back to the kind of good place that they had in the books in some ways where they're kind of operating as colleagues and equals mm -hmm. as you know investigator for Carson's law practice we're going to use that as an engine sometimes and also with this added wrench of kind of like well I've got billionaire dad waiting in the wings now what <laughs> and for Jennifer <laughs> these characters are just as iconic um, and I love that you know Nancy has always been very progressive this Nancy is so progressive in the fact that she's sex positive. She, I love the fact that she and, and George are not fighting over Nick. That Nick does not look like any one of the Nicks in any of the books. Um, <laughs> and then you've got like Best, who's all over the spectrum. Um, this, when you looked at these characters and, and how new and fresh they are, were there any things that you saw and you're like, oh yeah, there was kind of a hint of that in like this version of the books? I think when translating Nancy Drew to TV or film, what the fans want the most overall is just those essences of their character that they grew up reading. So if Nancy is bold and daring and independent and is a go-getter, that's great, even though it's modern. If George is brash and blunt and you know determined and you know standing up with her friends, that's great. And if Bess is, you know, a little more flighty or a little more dreamy, which, you know, that comes across some in this character, even though she has her bold moments as well, those kind of translate and you just sort of settle in to the way they're acting and it feels okay, even though there's so many changes, mm -hmm. at least for me. Well, so. you're, you are the professional fan, so I'm, I'm coming to you. <laughs> right, let's talk a little bit about, so the cast... So great. And the, the first question I got asked, the first question I got asked online was, will we find out Ace's last name? Oh. Oh. Well, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> one day you uh, will. We, okay. won't, we won't say when, but okay. one day you yeah. will. Okay. <laughs> uh, something that you guys managed to do, because there's like 66 
programs that film in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, you guys somehow managed to make this show not look like it was filmed in the Vancouver we see in every other show. Oh, right. You found locations, you found backdrops. That scene on the, on the, it was like the bridge with the mountains and the water behind you oh, when, when yeah. Ryan left her on the street. Yeah. Um, like, this was an incredible looking show. How did you manage like find spots of Vancouver that nobody has exploited yet? We got super lucky in the pilot where uh, we kind of dropped our anchor in Horseshoe Bay, so to speak. Uh, West Vancouver had been closed to filming for quite some time. And then right around the time that we were looking for locations, they're like, ah, we could probably have a film crew in here. And I want to credit all of production. The film crew was so respectful and left the place looking better than it was. And the rigging was invisible. And we were so great with our locations department and interfacing with the town. that they were like, OK, you can come back. So there's that. Lily Huey, our production our line producer, is a genius and a miracle worker. Larry Tang, who directed the pilot, who's been our producing director, also genius and a miracle worker. So he finds some of those locations and he's like, here's how we should shoot it. I need a drone. I need it, you know. And then, you know, we also had wonder wonderful people behind the camera in every department. Too many to list, but just like they made it happen. Um, and they found spots where they were just kind of like, let's embrace the fact that there's an ocean here and that there are green pine trees. Yeah. And, big sweeping vistas and, and let's not make it look like one of the other towns. We actually also were given specific mandates from the network. Don't make it look like such and such a show because we already have that show. Right. And so we took great pains not to do that. Yeah. Um, I feel so, like sometimes it looks fake. Like the backgrounds are honestly, so beautiful. Like that scene, like, I'm, like, really? I'm like, is that a background? No, that was on the side of a highway. Good. And, and you guys actually awesome. had a pretty mild winter in Vancouver this year. Yeah. So, Maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, because so. you do a lot of shooting on like cliffs and <laughs> night shoots, a lot of your Friday days. Um, <laughs> we had too many Friday days, actually. Let's I talk about the, the rest of the cast because you really did it. And, and we talked about like the casting of these characters. They're all so good. It's such a great ensemble. And they started as a great ensemble, but as the relationships on the show started to gel, Mm -hmm. That chemistry, that those characters really just started to, to to pop. And and Kennedy, you had this great scene with Alex uh, in the finale that was just such a lovely short mm -hmm. scene that it was like, oh, these are these are good kids who have just been you know clashing for a little bit, but they are actually like growing up together. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so well said. I feel like there have been. Uh a bunch of moments like that where you realize that all of these characters are coming together and from Nancy's point of view she's finally letting people I think Ace is maybe more so than anybody else at this point in time letting somebody take care of her mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. and and just for I think all the characters are having their own journeys in that letting people in you know with George and Nick and that whole relationship and I think yeah it's it's really quite beautiful I think where they've come to a place where yes, these are my friends and I'm going to let them be my friends and let them do what friends do. And at some point, I would assume, because when you get into a second season, you get to like really flesh out, like once we've met the people, we've gotten the, the world building, um, you can go deeper into their backstories. Yeah. Um, but Scott got to share, Scott, you got to share a bunch of scenes with the other car the other kids. Yeah. Which was a lot of fun to see how this guy, like dad, handles what I would think like the normal dad would be like, my daughter's falling in with a bad crowd. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're the ones breaking you out of jail. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean the crew, it is, as you've said, as Kennedy was saying, they're, they're all such, they're such great people. They're such uh, great actors and to watch their characters kind of develop individually and as a crew over the season was super fun. And yeah, it was great. It was great to get to kind of stick my nose in, with um, with each of them at various points. I even got, you know, there was some early, uh, there was a great moment in, um, that I loved it with, um, with Nick in the, in the finale where, uh, not in the finale, but the second to last episode where, you know, there's just a little bit of an olive branch, you know, um, and kind of, of this full circle moment of when we began this story, you were kind of a villain to me and a danger. And, and, and in a way, because of where Carson is now and, and you know, the fact that 
he's almost seen as a villain in this world, in this story, that there's this kind of kinship between them. And so it's been a blast. I'm, I'm excited. Like you said, a season two is an unbelievable opportunity to take a world we've built and characters that I think we all feel like we are really in their skin and them and ours in a way that we couldn't have been on day one. Mm -hmm. um and 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 jump jump into the next part of this story yeah and you were you were close to kennedy's age when you started on party of five mm -hmm. which is a lot of work those network schedules those network hours are a lot how did she handle being number one on the call sheet i mean uh <laughs> i can't even don't make me cry damien <laughs> Um, I, I just can't, <laughs> I, can't, I mean, I can't say enough about, about Kennedy as a, as a human being, as a, as an actor, as a, as a leader. And one of the things that they, that we talked about going into this show is obviously there's a lot at stake and this means a lot to everybody who's pouring themselves into it. And Noga and Melinda and I talked about how a lot of the cast are younger and Mm -hmm. and that it would be meaningful for somebody who's been around for a minute to to just be there and show up the right way and um and lead by example and those kinds of things but that didn't need to ever be me because they were looking first to kennedy and um there just was no room for anything but showing up being kind being professional and working hard she led the way for the entire production and i couldn't be more proud of her and i couldn't be more excited about the chance I've had to work with her and to keep on going. I feel like this is like, this is what happens when women are at the top. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, like when they're at the top of the list, like I feel like that's what the environment is. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I will, I, I also have to say just how integral Scott has been to me in this whole process. I mean, I, as, I've come to bumps in the road, whether with the external experience or the internal experience of it all. I mean, he has been an absolute rock to me throughout the whole experience. And I'm, I'm actually crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> because when I, you know, when I, when I, you know, when you feel like you don't have anything left to give, when you feel like you don't know which way to turn, when you like just it, he just has been such a, a source that set me back on on the right path and to encourage me on and it's just been incredible yeah i mean i would add to that that kennedy's wonderful with the crew all the cast are really really terrific and on their best game always as human beings which i truly appreciate i mean i was on set the day that we came back from the holiday break and um there was just like bubble of happiness when <laughs> Kennedy came in and she started hugging people and every person she discovered it was like she'd been walking from a hundred years of Craig. <laughs> oh my god yeah and there would just be these waves and waves of laughter and joyous reunions I mean it stopped us dead in the water for filming but it was wonderful <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it was it was wonderful and I kind of felt like this is why the show is working also that the crew and the cast really feel like they're very much a team pulling in the same direction that they take care of each other, they look out for each other. They're genuinely psyched to see each other in the morning when mm -hmm. they're recording. The it's wonderful. Yeah. Jennifer, the I, I don't think a lot of people realize, especially mo like modern viewers and readers, they don't realize that Carolyn Keene was many people. Yeah. This was <laughs> this was like a factory almost of writers, correct? Yeah, I mean the book packager and they had all these different series like Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys. And they had ghostwriters for all the different series. So they weren't, the, like, Carolyn Kane is just a pen name. Just a pen. And some of them were male writers, correct? Yeah, there were some. There was uh, a couple for the, uh, let's see, three for the classic series, like the first 56 books. Mostly women, and mostly two women did most of those books. That is, that it still baffles me that that was in the 30s and they were doing that. Like, I know there's publishers oh, yeah. now that do it. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Like, do these people now get credit? They do. I mean, most of them, you know, because fans or scholars have sort of uncovered who these people were. There was a huge trial back in 1980 between the two Nancy Drew publishers where a lot of it got on record. But in the 90s, there was this huge Nancy Drew conference at the University of Iowa. And they honored the first Carolyn Keene 
who I'm writing a biography about right now, Mildred Wirt Benson. So they brought her back to her alma mater. She was the first person to get the uh, master's in journalism there in 1927. So she was quite a go-getter. She was like a real life Nancy Drew. Uh, and so they outed her in a big way and she became nationally known at that time for sure. So that is well, very, that is really cool that there was like, again, progressive women getting yes. it done. <laughs> yep. So kind of a cool little, there've been all these little, um, I don't know, I, you could call them coincidences, but I believe they're more than that. But um, you know, telling this story, there was, there was a thing that had happened where someone had gifted us some Nancy Drew books um, when we, <laughs> right before we were starting the season. And I opened up one of the old, like first edition ones and the little girl who owned it had written her name in it and her name was Kennedy, um, which was so crazy. But Mildred, um, I got a knock on my door like a couple months ago and it was one of my neighbors and they were like, hey, we know you're doing this show. These are two books. My daughter worked with Mildred at a post office in, uh, or a library or somewhere in Detroit and Mildred had signed these, these books. So I was able to take a book that had been signed by Mildred and actually put it in Kennedy's hands, which was really oh, cool. Oh, that's that amazing. So cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I just got chills virtually. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> where, did, where are you pulling this mythology in this world building of like the Aglaica and all that? Like where, what pieces are you pulling from? I think some of the um, specifics come from, we just go on the internet. But also I would say Noga's got a, a great kind of guiding principle of like, what have, what has been done to people in the past, let's say women, that could make them return as a sea spirit who would curse people who had wronged her. You know, I think that there's definitely a vision of kind of like, um, basically the Me Too movement, I would say underpins a number of things in the show um, and kind of like listening to women and having their voices be heard in a dramatic way. Um, Noga, do you want to speak more to that about the mythology? Yeah, no, I think in season one, that was very much the guiding principle, exactly what Mel just said. It, the show came about during the Me Too era and it really informed the kind of stories you want to tell. In our show, I think the other guiding principle is that because we're also going to see, we're also going to see boy ghosts. We're also going to see ghosts that were never human in the first place. You know, the world opens up more and more and more as we step into season two um, when it comes to the supernatural. But, but I think to us, the guiding principle is always, if we put something supernatural on the show, what is the metaphor that we are telling a story of? Because I think every ghost in the real world exists for a reason and is an extension of people's stories that that carry on after death or in you know another realm and it's important to always ground the supernatural entity in some human truth and when you speak about the me too movement you had that incredible scene which was i was waiting for it how george uh -huh. and ryan would come to that reckoning and it was such a beautifully written scene that i feel was so important for not just young women to see but yeah. also young men and older men to see you yeah. handled that without like, without putting a neon sign on it, but you gave, you gave George back her power in that scene. Yeah. Thank you. We did, we did a lot of, I personally just, when I, every morning when I'm getting ready, I'm usually listening to podcasts. And when this all, you know, exploded in the Me Too movement, a lot of what I was listening to was how the, how the survivors, whatever term you want to use, victims, survivors, whatever it is, how the people who gone through um, events like that as young people, how they come out on the other side with their souls whole. And so, you know, Mel and I did a lot of talking with the room about how best to uh, drive George as a character to the point where she was capable of doing that. And the scene was beautifully written by Erica Harrison and Jesse Stern, our writers for that episode. And the scene yeah. was beautifully executed by Riley and Leah were amazing. Yeah. And we have a wonderful writing staff. I'll just shout out to them briefly. They are a hive mind of fabulousness and crazy jokes and fun mythological twists and just like, you wouldn't believe the stuff they come up with or you would because you've seen it on TV, but it's like very much a team effort and we owe so much to them. Awesome. Well, listen, you guys are so fantastic. I'm so happy and so excited for you guys because you got a season two. It's on HBO Max and the CW app. So more and more people are finding it during this time where we're all watching a lot of TV. And, uh, and I can't wait to talk to you guys about next season once it all starts up. So stay safe and thank you guys so much. Thanks, Damien. Thank you so much, Damien. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.